I'm Lucia Dolce, I'm the chair of the Center of Buddhist Studies here at SOAS, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first of this academic year Robert Ho Family Foundation lecture series in Chinese Buddhism that are hosted by the Center of Buddhist Studies here. Um, this is uh, the first uh, virtual event for us. Um, the SOAS campus closed the last March and our lecture seminars have been moved online and we have remained basically closed uh, with all teaching and uh, other activities carried out virtually. And so we are, um, we are in a sense happy that we are able to continue our research event online. And I'm delighted uh, uh, that our first speaker has accepted to, uh, to, to, to do his uh, uh, lecture with this new means. Um, I'd like to say a few words about the series and then introduce our speaker. Um, this is the fourth year that we are running uh, the whole lectures in Chinese Buddhism. The aim of this series is to engage with Chinese Buddhism from a variety of uh, uh, disciplines, uh, from non-sectarian perspective, looking at uh, uh, the findings from uh, uh, historical, sociological, art historical, material cultural perspective, to explore the impact of Buddhism on Chinese culture and society in the past and in the present. Um, this is a series which is made of a lecture, a public lecture, which we normally would have at, at the theatre, SOAS, and uh, also a seminar for students. This is the occasion also for a platform for advanced uh, graduate training. And, um, and I'm pleased again that uh, our speaker today has been happy to, um, to, do, to, to agree to a seminar tomorrow. So this has been a great occasion every year. Um, we have normally three lectures. Uh, this first lecture is actually something that we had scheduled uh, for uh, last May and that we had cancelled because of COVID-19. So uh, this will be the first of four lectures uh, um, that will uh, um, entertain uh, as this academic year. And I'm, uh, um, I'd like also to, to take the opportunity to express our appreciation to the whole foundation for um, enabling us to create this moment of learning and uh, uh, sharing uh, knowledge about Chinese Buddhists. And uh, now is my great pleasure to introduce um, tonight's speaker, Professor James Robson from Harvard University. Um, Professor Robson is uh, the James Kralik and Yunilu Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilization at Harvard and uh, 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 the director of the Harvard University Asia Center, um, as well as the director of the Regional Study East Asia Program. Um, James received just a, a PhD from Stanford University and has done many years of research in East Asia, in China, Taiwan, and Japan. You would have read uh, the details of his achievement in the announcement that we sent out, but uh, I'd like to say a few words about his uh, contribution uh, to Chinese Buddhism in, uh, in um, many of areas that are perhaps the areas in between the mainstream narratives on, uh, on Buddhism and covered also some of the gray areas of uh, uh, both in terms of topics and material. Um, his interest in cultic centers and uh, uh, sacred mountains as a shared space uh, by gods, by different gods and different religious lineages has produced a, a wonderful study of Nanyue uh, Mountain in, uh, um, in a book from 2009 called The Power of Place, the religious landscape of the Southern Sacred Peak in medieval China a book that has been uh, very well reviewed and received and uh, has been the recipient of uh, two uh, important prizes, the uh, Stanislav Julian Prize awarded by the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres and uh, the Toshide Numada Prize in Buddhist Studies. Um, one, one thing that has characterized uh, uh, Professor Robinson's work is the combination of different sources um, 
He draws from canonical material, official histories, encyclopedias, biographical collections, to give the, an idea of uh, um, the variety of means that we have to retrace the history of Buddhism and the interaction between Buddhism and other, um, and other religious traditions. I think we would like also to note um, the, the interest of looking at China within East Asia and uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the exploration of uh, practices that are uh, common to uh, China and other East Asian countries. Um, he has a current project on which has been working for a very long time. I remember having listened to uh, the early stages of this project on the conference of uh, Monaster, uh, Buddhist monasteries and mental hospitals in Japan. Um, but he has also worked in many articles on uh, um, amulets, uh, museums, um, material culture, and I think this is very uh, much connected to what uh, um, he's going to talk about uh, today. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to leave the floor to Professor Robson. I'd like before to remind you that there is space for uh, questions. You will have to write them down in the QA at the bottom of the webinar, and uh, we will be happy to, um, to pick up uh, uh, your questions, the most popular questions, if there are many, but we hope, we hope to have at least 30 minutes and maybe a little bit more to engage with, uh, uh, with the audience. So I leave the floor to Professor Robson and please, uh, James, imagine a warm applause to welcome you to the stage. Thank you. Let me go ahead and just share my screen first of all. So hopefully everybody can see that okay. Is it coming through okay to you, Lucia? Yes. Yes, good, yes. okay, wonderful. So thank you so much for the uh, introduction, Lucia, and also um, thanks to everybody for uh, uh, helping to set this up at uh, rather rather quickly, which I really appreciate. And also uh, this goes back, uh, as Lucia said, back to um, the spring when we were supposed to have this uh, visit in person in London. And uh, at that time, I had been communicating quite a lot with Emanuela Sala, so I'd like to say thanks. Uh, and also to uh, Yeonju Lee, who then picked things up uh, the last couple of weeks uh, to bring us uh, here uh, today. So, um, you know, this is a, uh, I've been, for the Asia Center, I've been having to run a number of these uh, kind of talks myself, actually in the hundreds already. And this is the first time I've actually done my own. I've been sort of avoiding them. But in some ways, you know, the, the not being able to be in person uh, is uh, is not ideal, but um, you know, as our world has become you know much smaller in many ways with this COVID crisis, um, there's also uh, it's also true that this new medium has sort of opened things up and made the uh, things like this open to a kind of potentially worldwide audience. So um, so here we are. So thanks very much everybody for for showing up. So. Um, so the, this, the, the, this is also another project I've been working on for quite a long time, and it's just changed a lot over the years. Um, it really uh, began uh, some time ago with uh, some small statues like this uh, that, um, that all come from the Hunan region of China and South Central China um, uh, in the area of the, uh, the, of, uh, the topic of my first book, this, this mountain site there, and was part of a larger uh, collaborative project that was uh, begun by by uh, Professor Alain Aro of the uh, of the Ecole Française d'Extrême Orient, and um, then uh, so we had uh, begun working on this, and these are uh, some of the contents that come from that type of a statue. And uh, out of that, it kind of sent me on this uh, uh, long, <laughs> sort of many years of trying to uh, explore this issue of statues that have materials put inside of them. I may try to come back to these. Uh, um, uh, statues at the very end of the talk, but it's not going to be the, the main focus of this um, uh, for various reasons. But uh, as part of that process of, of thinking about uh, statues with contents inside of them, 
realized that this is something uh, that was not just unique uh, to East Asia or even uh, to this one region that I'd been that we've been looking at. And and as I looked around uh, throughout the world, you will find uh, statues in museums uh, in different collections uh, that have contents inside of them. Uh, this one, uh, a uh, votive image of Saint Foy uh, from France uh, from the 10th century uh, that contains uh, part of her skull and some of her bones inside of it. Um, there's a, some very famous uh, images uh, that come from primarily West Africa. Uh, um, this one in, of these Congo figures uh, that are just in the B Boston Museum of Fine Arts uh, 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 that have contents inside of their bellies. And we've now with the new technologies of being able to do CT scans of things, uh, a lot of these images have been discovered to have uh, medicinal uh, uh, um, medicinals put inside of the, uh, the stomach cavity that uh, you can see here. Um, many different types, even uh, these are some actually from the, uh, the Kakure Christian period in Japan of images uh, from Northern Kyushu with rosaries and other things that are put in, in a cavity that's in the backside of the statues as well. Um, and then we get these wonderful sort of images that open up that have uh, images inside of images uh, that are quite interesting. These are quite rare, that, like the one I'm showing you right here. Uh, but there's a very famous uh, image called the Morgan Madonna, uh, which um, uh, is, a, is a beautiful image uh, that uh, dates to the 12th century uh, that's in the Met Museum. And this one, uh, if you turn this uh, wooden image around uh, just very faintly on the back, uh, on the left side as you're viewing the screen, but it's on its right shoulder, you can see there's a very faint uh, kind of a square there. And uh, this is image, hopefully you can see it a little better. And uh, this is a very uh, small uh, cavity that's, uh, that's in there um, that uh, served as a container uh, for relics that were put inside of this image. And there's also another um, uh, image or an another uh, relic, uh, uh, reliquary on the front side, which I'll show you in just a second. But um, in a description of this uh, statue, uh, a commentator wrote, it says, the image had a most secret little door between the shoulders. Uh, when he heard this, Giles, the prior of the monastery, ordered it to be carried into the sacristy. He called Godfrey, the sub-prior, and Gervais, the sacrament, sacrosanct and Gerard the constable and, and others. Finally, he took a small iron hammer and he tried to, um, uh, with, a, with a small knife and scraped away the colors uh, and then was able to finally open it up. And uh, he opened the little door and in his uh, hands, uh, he was able to pull out a small lock of hair of the Immaculate Virgin and part of the same uh, Mary. So he, he also found bones of the John the Baptist uh, and so this um, uh, image then actually had uh, relics that were put in these two cavities. Here's the, so you saw the backside and then on the front, you can see right on the chest here, another cavity that held uh, those relics. One of the more interesting uh, ones that I came across in doing and uh, looking around at these different types of images uh, was this uh, 18th century um, uh, Spanish image of Christ uh, that when they began to do some repairs on it, uh, they brought it down uh, and uh, um, began to uh, work on it in the lab. And they found that there was a uh, cover actually uh, covering the butt of the statue um, and inside of the cavity in the butt, uh, they found uh, all kinds of um, manuscripts that were stuffed inside of this and pulled these out. And uh, th these were actually incredibly localized um, uh, records uh, that detailed the local history of this of the village where the statue uh, uh, was located um, and included um, uh, all sorts of uh, history about the harvests, uh, about uh, different types of problems that were happening in the village. Um, uh, and these were all written down on these uh, uh, manuscripts that were put inside the body of that uh, image. So these these types of statues are, are literally everywhere one begins uh, to look for look for them. Uh, this image, some of you may be aware of, um, I got sort of caught up in this uh, um, 
uh, uh, a sort of a uh, controversy regarding this image of this Zhang Gong Fuxi from uh, Fujian, which had been on the art market uh, as a I think people thought it was a Buddha image. Um, it was uh, owned by a collector from the Netherlands who put it on display at a at a um, exhibition in uh, Budapest, and in preparation for. Um, putting it on display, when they uh, picked it up off the pillow that it's sitting on, it separates uh, from the body and the kind of zafu that it's sitting on, um, uh, some bones fell out of it. And so they began to do some research on it and realized this was not a gilded Buddha or anything like that at all. But in fact, uh, when they did a CT scan of it um, uh, to try to figure out what was going on, they found actually it had a whole body mummy inside of it that had been uh, wrapped and gilded and uh, uh, and and so on. And, and then it had been stolen uh, from a, a place in Fujian, uh, which became part of the controversy of, uh, of trying to repatriate it there. Uh, the collector um, was unwilling to do so and there's, it's currently unknown uh, where it's at now. But it, this attracted quite a lot of press. Uh, um, the sort of shock that people had of finding something inside of a statue. And that's kind of a, a, an overall theme that one finds in these stories is that people are amazed to find that a statue might have something inside of it. And what I hope to do today is to, uh, uh, to, to sort of change your mind on this and, and convince you that in fact, we should be uh, more surprised when statues don't have things inside of them uh, rather than when they do. Um, some of you may have uh, noticed just uh, this past summer, uh, there was a, a news report that came out of uh, Japan about this um, Manjushri image at the, uh, at the Daichiji Monastery uh, that's located in Kizugawa in Kyoto Prefecture um, that has this 14th century uh, Manjushri that they uh, uh, also uh, did this uh, scan on and found it to be filled with uh, quite a lot of different uh, objects uh, inside of it um, from manuscripts uh, to, uh, to small images. And this attracted quite a lot of press uh, in Japan. And you can see here just how um, sophisticated the scanning technology is now that one can actually see very clearly where everything is. They can even count objects. And so one of the things you can see here is that uh, there's an object that's put in the throat cavity here. This will also be important as we go along uh, to try to uh, pay attention to where things are located inside of the, uh, the statues. And then you have a number of scrolls that are in the base here. And then also uh, uh, this is the uh, small image that's in the throat that was also inside of a little reliquary that was there then wrapped with a uh, inside of a bag. Uh, and it, you can just see the detail that they can get uh, on, on that scan. And then this is the um, uh, a small uh, um, uh, manuscript that's inside of there. Uh, normally, um, this wouldn't show up if it was written in Sumi ink, which wouldn't uh, get picked up. But fortunately, this one uh, was actually written in uh, red lacquer with gold. And uh, you see these different mantras that are all uh, clearly these uh, from the Prajnaparamitta and the Heart Sutra here um, uh, uh, that, are, um, that, that are visible. So that image attracted quite a lot of attention, as did one uh, from the previous summer uh, that was from the Hokeiji Monastery. And this is uh, another Manjushri image. Um, and this one uh, had been put on display. It's also uh, is a 13th century image, very quite beautiful. Um, this is the image uh, from Hokeiji. Hokeiji uh, and, and Saidaiji, which is another, uh, the, the former image that I just showed you from Kyoto Prefecture actually was connected to Saidaiji and there was a lot of, uh, if you go through records on, on Japanese images with uh, materials inside of them, there seems to be a big connection to uh, Saidaiji. But in any case, Hokeiji, this 13th century one, again, uh, that uh, the um, imagery was done. And you can see, again, a cavity in the head, cavity in the neck, and then a cavity in the body. So there's kind of three different zones. Um, this one, you can see a small stoop and other things uh, up, in the, up in the head. And then there's something on the order of about 140 40 different uh, uh, texts that are put inside the, the, the body of this one. Um, so again, and here just to show you uh, the clarity with which you can get on these scans nowadays uh, to see what's uh, inside of these images. And there's just a close-up of it with all of the rolled uh, manuscripts. So 
one of the problems that we have uh, in studying this uh, topic actually of, of images with uh, contents inside of them for China in particular um, uh, is the fact uh, that many of these statues that uh, we would like to have access to um, uh, were destroyed uh, at different uh, points throughout Chinese history and uh, most recently uh, during uh, the Cultural Revolution uh, from the 1960s and 1970s. And, uh, but we do have some records actually of uh, that um, give us some hints uh, about this practice in China. And so I'm showing you here just one of these uh, records um, and just showing how uh, that um, uh, during the Cultural Revolution when this statue uh, was destroyed, they found this cavity that had 6,000 uh, dran, 6,000 scrolls of, uh, of Buddhist text from the Ming Dynasty uh, printing of the uh, Buddhist canon. And so this is really quite incredible to think of the, um, of the scale of that. Uh, where, you know, what happened to those uh, manuscripts is, is entirely unknown uh, at this point. Um, uh, this is a little unfortunate that um, when I was uh, uh, meant to give this talk in the spring. I had um, planned to go to China to do some field work to track down some of this stuff. And unfortunately, uh, travel was cut off. And so it was impossible to do that. So some of the material, I'll, I just had to base myself off of archaeological reports and other materials uh, to get a sense of, 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 of what's available. Um, but that gives us a little hint. Now, so that's uh, just a kind of a little opening uh, here just to um, get us into the subject. But um, before turning uh, to the East Asian material, I thought first just a little bit of background when we think about the putting of things inside of statues. Um, uh, the, it, it became clear as we tracked this back um, or trying to find you know, when did this begin and what are the earliest statues that we have or when can we, when did this sort of notion of thinking about putting things inside of Buddhist uh, um, statues uh, begin? And it clearly, I think, goes back, uh, is related to uh, uh, relics and uh, that are, and, and uh, textual material that would be put inside of uh, stupas. Um, and uh, it seems as if there is no, there are no uh, extant examples of Buddhist statues statues from India uh, that actually have relics inside of them, though uh, there may be one exception, uh, an interesting image from um, Nagarjuna Kondha that uh, seems to have had a relic that was, um, when, the, when the statue uh, was broken, uh, they found that there was a hole in the lower section of it um, on the backside between the legs of it, which contained a golden tube that had uh, 95 pearls and some ash in it, possibly bone ash, but it's unclear. And uh, Osman uh, Baparachai uh, also mentioned to me that, um, that in fact, the, the record may be more robust than we think it is uh, in that some of the statues, maybe uh, because they were primarily of stone, uh, may not have had cavities uh, inside of them, but relics would have been placed uh, between the image and the pedestal. So down uh, in, a, in, a, in a space that's created in the pedestal of the, of, of the image. Um, so may, even though the... the um, the images uh, uh, may not be extant or very few. This practice of inserting relics in uh, Buddhist images is, is in fact actually well attested in a variety of textual sources that range all the way from Sri Lanka, uh, mentioned uh, by Buddhaghosa in the fifth century, uh, to central and north India with mentions in the Mula Sarvastivada Vinaya, uh, the monastic code of, of, of the Mula Sarvastivadins, um, and also in the writings of Chinese pilgrims who went to India, including Shranzan and Yi Jing. Um, uh, Ju Hong Ri uh, uh, has also in, has a study that I'm sure many are, are familiar with, and he has noted that, quote, the Mula Sarvastavada Vinaya states in various recensions that to steal an image with a relic is a pachitya, and to steal one without a relic is a dukstra. And so this indicates then that uh, the lesser offense uh, was to steal an image without a relic and a more consequential offense was to steal one with a relic. And then we also know from a later text, the Samanta Pasadika, a fifth century commentary on the Pali Vinayas, um, also uh, states that, quote, learned people having first set up either a reliquary or an image enclosing relics, give gifts to both the Sangha um, headed by the Buddha and, and so on. And so in the textual record, then it seems we have uh, um, uh, 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 
citations that seem to uh, suggest that this practice of inserting uh, materials inside of statues began in India and was transported to China and the rest of East Asia uh, with the movement of Buddhism. So we have these um, uh, statements by Xuanzang, for example, here of the practice in India of making incense powder into paste uh, to make small stupas five to six inches high. People write pieces of scripture and place them into the interiors of the small stupas, and these they call Dharma Sharira. Um, also, uh, Divakara, um, if inside the stupa uh, one encloses the body of the Tathagatha down to even one minute, minute portion of his relics, hair, teeth, beard, or fingernails, or if somebody uh, deposits the 12 section scripture, which is a storehouse of the Tathagata's Dharma down to even one uh, four line verse, this person's merit will be as great as the Brahma heaven. And then uh, um, those who have worked on the Gilgit materials have also noticed this short text that states that image of the Buddha should be made either tall or short with either a relic or with a Pratitya uh, Samutpada Gata inside of it uh, that many people have studied. And then there's a later, uh, quite much later, uh, Indian text, the Vajravali by uh, Abhaya Karagupta, that states that, quote, you should at the time of making an image, and th this is, I think, really quite interesting, and pay attention to the date here as we move uh, forward and across into East Asia as well. So here, 11th, uh, late 11th century, you should at the time of making an image, leave the head or back hollow. When completed, you should write a Dharani on birch bark with saffron or bezoar and wrap them around the relic, which has been purified, through bathing, through the bathing ritual, and then place them in the hollow space. So here, actually, this is uh, at least as far as I know, in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, stating clearly about it, leaving a cavity in the head or the back of a statue uh, that we have from uh, South Asia. And then I Ching finally, uh, where he says whether um, they build images or make chaityas, uh, be they gold, silver, bronze, iron. Uh, uh, paste, lacquer, brick, or stone, uh, or they uh, heap up sand like snow. When they make them, they place uh, inside two kinds of relics. Uh, one is the bodily relic. Second is the Dharma verse, okay, um, and so on. And then at the end, he says, the image or stupa should be like my present body equal without uh, any difference. So uh, again, that uh, conjoining of, uh, of stupas uh, and images there. So when we move, when we think about East Asia, however, um, the most famous, uh, clearly, and everybody I'm sure is aware of this, is the, the very famous Seiryoji Shaka image uh, that was brought uh, from uh, China uh, to Japan in 988. And this uh, uh, image has attracted a, a large amount of attention uh, because of, the, uh, uh, well, for a number of reasons, um, uh, but uh, for the purpose of this talk, due to the large cavity that's in the back, this is almost a, a life-size uh, image, by the way, quite quite large, uh, but it included uh, a large amount of uh, texts that were inside of it and a huge cache of textiles as well, in addition to coins um, and other inscriptions that were on it. It's been studied uh, a lot by Henderson and Herberts. Herberts have written about it and, and a number of J uh, Japanese scholars, but the inscriptions tell us exactly where it's from, who the donors were, and all of that. So this statue... Um, which uh, um, was initially um, uh, opened uh, when uh, fortunately the abbot of the Seiryoji temple uh, happened to be the very famous uh, uh, Chinese Buddha or Japanese uh, scholar of Chinese Buddhism, uh, Tsukamoto Zenryu. And so he was willing uh, to allow scholars to, uh, to open up this image. Um, uh, and when they opened it, then they found all of these uh, materials inside. And then uh, the first, um, uh, publication in English was the article by Henderson and Hurwitz in 1956. And so uh, people have known about this kind of practice for quite a long time. Uh, but initially, it didn't uh, seem to have uh, spawned much uh, curiosity or further research um, by scholars. But uh, again, this is uh, the most famous probably image in there uh, from that statue is the uh, viscera, uh, the five uh, organs inside made of silk and uh, embroidered. And then these are the donor lists uh, uh, and the story about the, the two pilgrims that went. There are uh, printed uh, editions of the um, uh, of uh, Prajnaparamita text. There's also printed a lot of uh, uh, Lotus Sutra, and there's also a manuscript version of the Lotus Sutra as well. So um, the textual material is also quite robust. 
what really kicked off interest in Japan um, and uh, in the study of other images uh, was the publication uh, in 1973 of Kurata Bunsaku's, the special edition of Nihon no Bijutsu, um, where uh, he introduced, um, in addition to, um, uh, while well, the main focus was on the Seiryoji image, in fact, in the introduction to it, he introduces uh, statues that are held at a number of uh, different temples from Saidaiji, which I mentioned, uh, to Denkoji, Todaiji, all of these. And that actually um, uh, kicked off a steady stream of publications uh, and research articles and books and, uh, and all kinds of things on, uh, particularly on Japanese Buddhist images. Uh, but it also uh, opened people's eyes to the fact that um, more statues than we might be aware of uh, actually have contents inside of them. So here's just some of the uh, terminology that cross over, as we'll see here, uh, a practice that extends uh, from South Asia uh, to China to Japan and also, as I'll come to a little bit later uh, in Korea, uh, with this uh, Pokjong tradition that's uh, there for consecrating statues. So now um, there's been an, an, a number of, of different um, images that have been opened, uh, some very famous uh, ones that I'll get to a little bit later. Um, uh, but one of the um, earliest images, and this again uh, really was shocking to me in terms of uh, uh, thinking about chronology uh, and also materials, because most people thought that uh, the, the that the only images that might have contents in them might be wooden images, uh, just because of the um, ability to put a cavity into it easily. But some of the cast images that we have, uh, such as this um, uh, uh, image that's from the Harvard Art Museums, which I chose uh, just um, uh, for an example, comes from uh, dates probably to the third or the fourth uh, century. And in this one, you can see at the uh, in the Ushnisha at the very top, there's a cavity on the top of the head uh, that would have uh, contained a, a small relic uh, in, in it there. And the, the base of it is also hollow, but it seems it's unclear if anything was ever you, uh, put inside uh, the base of it, but the relic uh, would have been inside the head of it. We also have um, a number of uh, images that are scattered uh, throughout museums uh, throughout the world. And uh, now I'm focusing just on the the earliest uh, Chinese images. Um, and uh, in most cases, one would go to one of these museums and uh, all you would see is perhaps the, the image on display, but there would be nothing to indicate uh, that it, um, uh, you know, had anything, uh, and, and the way that, at least earlier on, the way that images were often displayed in museums, it was, it was not possible to see around the, um, the back sides of those images, which fortunately, uh, uh, curators these days are, are um, uh, pay much more attention to this and the ability to now uh, observe and see what kinds of, uh, to walk around an image in uh, 360 degrees and, and see it. Um, so the backsides are very important. But prior to that, uh, the only indication was if you were to look this image up in the museum uh, cataloging or in their acquisition notes, uh, they might have noted something. And so for this one, we find, in fact, in the notes that were kept on it, it says that there is a cavity in the back. Uh, and it says that it had lapis lazuli, rock crystal, mother of pearl, two silk textiles, and four small blocks of fragrant wood. And it's unclear what uh, happens to these often uh, when, uh, after the notes were taken, what they've done with the contents of them. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in, in just a minute. But uh, so here we have a fifth century bronze image that had all of that inside of it. And again, here a, a Northern Way Maitreya image. Um, again, quite beautiful. Uh, and if one, uh, this one, they did a radiograph scan of it and showed a cavity uh, in the back of it, um, a, a chamber for a, uh, for a relic, it seems, that would have been uh, put inside there. Um, so I can keep going in terms of uh, showing the regional spread of this. Uh, um, this image uh, coming uh, of image of Guan Yin that, uh, from Yunnan province from the Dali Kingdom, 11th, 12th century. Um, and again, uh, this one uh, um, had a small, uh, this cavity on the, on the back side of it um, and uh, it seems to have had two, one in the lower part and then also in the, uh, in the, in the body of it. Uh, some of, of you may be aware of the, um, the famous example of the Lingyan Si, which is in Shandong province, which has these uh, really quite incredible collection of uh, 40 Arhat statues. And these uh, um, uh, date to around the 11th century. 
um, have been celebrated for their verisimilitude and the quality of the carving. And when, uh, when scholars began to, uh, to work on these, uh, you can see here the, just the beauty of the, of the sculpting of them. When they began to do research on these, they found uh, that like the Savioji image, these were stuffed with uh, uh, the five viscera uh, in these long uh, sort of uh, intestines here made of cloth uh, and different colored other organs that were part of it and also contained uh, bronze mirrors. And this is another common theme that we'll see in a lot of them is the putting of mirrors inside of the, uh, inside of the statues as well. Um, the, uh, this is the, unfortunately, um, gaining access to uh, precise information about what's on the inside of these statues is often very difficult because often all we have are those acquisition notes or uh, this is a, a report that Wenwu did of those uh, arhats from the Lingyan Si, uh, but it's it's very difficult to make out the, uh, the um, uh, textual material that's in inside of there, which they say that it contained, uh, but there's been very little published on that. But here you can see the mirrors and, and, and the viscera that were put inside there pretty uh, clearly. So um, so the, the question here uh, for me was that um, that every time there was one of these discoveries of uh, images with uh, um, with contents inside of them, often the scholars will will express a, a certain type of surprise or or say these are unique statues or uh, 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 that this is such a rarity. When in fact, um, as scholars, uh, we should have um, uh, known much more about this earlier on. And the scholarship on the on the Chinese statues actually lags behind the work in Japan by by quite a lot even though some of the earliest and most detailed published descriptions of statues in their contents concerns Chinese statues, ironically. Um, in fact, today, most people uh, think of the, the, uh, the, the, the quantity of statues in Japan as sort of representative, maybe something was going on there, but in fact, many of the uh, images and precisely the ones I've shown you thus far are scattered in museums throughout the world. Um, uh, and in fact, those uh, come from, originated in China, but, uh, uh, but, but move to different collections. So in fact, one of the most uh, unlikely sources uh, perhaps uh, for finding information, and this is where um, one has to, I, I became frustrated a little bit by this inability to track things down or find things that were in situ. Uh, and, um, uh, but then realized that one of our most valuable uh, resources here and unlikely ones was uh, late 19th and early 20th century missionary records uh, that were written uh, by those who were actually quite inimical to this practice of icon animation or icon uh, 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 consecration. So um, I'm sure it, you can see the irony here is uh, that those who were the iconoclasts that were bent on destroying images, um, in their descriptions of those images, they actually preserved uh, the best information that we have about most of the, uh, uh, about uh, images in East Asia and particularly in China. So for example, so the iconoclast then turns out to be the preserver. And uh, the one account, uh, I'll just uh, give you a couple of examples. Um, and I've written about these elsewhere, so um, pardon me if, you've, if, if you're aware of them, but one of them is uh, by the British Protestant missionary Joseph Edkins, who wrote in, in his chapter entitled Images and Image Worship in, in 1880, he wrote this. So uh, just think a little bit now about how this early date when we have a, uh, this kind of a description. And he says, the Peking custom in making large images, whether they're brass, iron, wood, or clay, is to construct them with the internal organs as complete as possible. When the, when the smaller images are filled with incense or cotton wool, the larger have the interior arranged according to Chinese notions of anatomy. The heads are always empty. The chief viscera of the chest and the abdomen are always represented. They are of silk or satin, and their shape is that found in drawings of the organs and native medical works. A round piece of silk represents the heart whose element is fire, it's the size of a dollar. And it is in the lungs which are white are divided into three lobes and attached to a piece of wood around which a piece of yellow paper having on it a prayer. To the wood is attached uh, silk threads of five colors and a metallic mirror. Uh, this represents intelligence, the heart being regarded as the seat of the mind. The lungs cover the heart as the umbrella or lid as if uh, to preserve it from injury. In the abdomen, the intestines are made of long, narrow pieces of silk with uh, cotton wool stitched along the concave border. 
this may, uh, and then he goes on and, and says what it uh, represents. But then interestingly, he says, the larger and older idols have in many cases been rifled of these little valuables. No one knows when. Poor priests in want of money, if, if the fear of sacrilege is not strong in their minds, uh, know where to get help. <laughs> so that the idols uh, in their interior of which gold and silver were once deposited ha now have none. And so he says that, that uh, uh, even gives us very precise description of what was put inside, uh, but, but says that now uh, uh, many of them had been pilfered uh, and, and the contents taken out. So even in many cases, the earlier ones would have already had, uh, been taken out. Slightly later, just seven years later than that, um, uh, we have, uh, in 1887, uh, the following account of an idol factory in, in North China by the Presbyterian missionary Ham, uh, Hampton C. DeBose. And he says, now, uh, and this is the image that's up on here, he included these woodcuts with his, uh, uh, in that publication. And he says, walk into one of the shops with several hundred images of all sizes, from three inches to 10 feet high. If of wood, the head is on the counter, the arm on the bench, the body on the floor, and the foot on the shelf. And then he says, the foot is pinned to the leg, the leg to the body, the arm to the shoulder, the head to the neck, and lo, it is now a god. And then he says, and includes a new uh, woodcut like this. And he says, note the hole in the back. And he says, a frog, a snake, a lizard, or a centipede is caught and put inside for the soul, and then it is a living deity, end of quote, okay? So this is really quite incredible to have, uh, actually, first of all, to see the uh, uh, image or statue represented from the backside. I mean, this was uh, quite uh, shocking uh, to come across. Um, and exactly like we see on these images with uh, primarily the cavities in the, in the back of the torso. Now, um, I, another place where, in addition to uh, some of those um, early uh, books that one finds these in, there's in missionary writings uh, from, again, from the uh, early 20th century. And, and in one of these I encountered in, the, in a, um, uh, uh, one of those collections of the Church Missionary Gleaner from 1916, it had a very intriguingly entitled uh, article entitled An Idol Soul, which caught my attention after reading the previous uh, passage where they described that as the soul of an idol. And this uh, turned out to be a really fascinating kind of story and, and uh, to try to track down what was going on here. Uh, but clearly uh, what was going on in the early 20th century is that uh, missionaries in China, in addition to describing those statues, they were also taking them uh, off of altars, out of temples, uh, and sending them back to Europe uh, as proof that they had uh, uh, made a conversion of somebody uh, and had gotten those images out of their hands. And some of them, sorry for the poor quality of the image, these are very hard to find actually of what these were, but many were sent back and then um, uh, put inside of the London Missionary Society Museum. And so there were, there were different uh, museums set up by different groups. There was uh, the Church Missionary Society, the London Missionary Society, the uh, um, uh, the Methodist Missionary Society and uh, the London Missionary Society was had a uh, quite a large uh, collection of these and so you can see very uh, kind of faintly here Buddhist images and smaller statues that are in some of the cases. I'll show you a slightly better one here. This one somebody has actually mapped out where uh, the different regions they weren't just collecting from East Asia but uh, from all over the world from Africa from uh, Polynesia other area just uh, basically everywhere that they could find things where heathens supposedly were living and these were their proofs of, of, of conversions. And so, um, so this was the one clue was uh, that it seemed as if, uh, and this is another one, you can see actually a Buddha image on the floor here um, as well, and then the cabinets that are filled. And this is a, a uh, was done in 18, this uh, image in 1847. In any case, I figured since we were uh, uh, giving a talk at SOAS, or at least virtually here, um, it's interesting to note that uh, that the materials that had been in the London Missionary Society collection uh, are actually now uh, were sent to SOAS actually to be managed. Um, and this is what I was hoping to be able to look at if I were there in person uh, to go through some of this um, material, which seems to be mainly um, textual material. I've tried to look through the collection um, 
uh, records that you can see is linked on here as well. Uh, but there were some intriguing notes uh, that were in there um, that caught my attention in one of the boxes, uh, uh, talks about correspondence about transfer of curios to the British Museum. Um, and it's unclear uh, uh, right now, this one was a little bit later, but it seems to be uh, the fact that the London Missionary Society Museum closed in 1910. Uh, and uh, it seems as if the objects, at least, that were in that, uh, uh, many of those went to the British Museum and also perhaps, uh, as I'll show in a minute, uh, to the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, and others were sold uh, generally, um, unfortunately dispersed. So, so then um, uh, I uh, decided, okay, let's follow the track. And I'd also heard um, from Roderick, Roderick Whitfield some stories about something he mentioned after I had uh, given a talk on or mentioned the soul of an idol. He said, you know, I, I think I remember something uh, that we used to be passed around in the British Museum that people jokingly called the soul of an idol. Uh, so on a visit um, uh, to the British or to uh, uh, the UK to give a uh, talk, I um, uh, spent a day and thanks uh, to the kindness of Jessica Harrison Hollow, I think maybe signed on today. Um, she was game to look around for some of this stuff uh, and try to track it down. And so uh, in the storage rooms, there was a cabinet uh, that had some of these small statues and I uh, that we're hoping uh, to do something with in the future. Um, and sure enough, I mean, there's some very cool ones. You can see this guy, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but in any case on the lower right here with a, a, with like, a like a British bowler hat on, uh, which uh, was quite interesting, but you'll see many of those are Buddha images as well. But the thing that caught my attention was the uh, tags um, that have a 1910 date on them, which is exactly the year that the London Missionary Society Museum closed. So it seems uh, perhaps that these are precisely the those uh, statues that had been originally sent back by the mission. And we, in fact, we know these were because there's writing on the pedestal on the backside uh, and uh, explaining who they were, but were probably part of that collection. More interestingly, and this was the image used, after we had looked at those statues and we're kind of looking through some other um, materials, um, there was a drawer uh, that was primarily uh, metalwork and jewelry, if I remember correctly. Uh, but this uh, caught my eye um, uh, immediately. And uh, this uh, this object, um, uh, when I went back uh, to my hotel room and, and looked back at that article in the Church Missionary Gleaner from 1916, I realized this is exactly the um, object that uh, had been uh, published in the Church Missionary Gleaner in 1916, uh, which describes very clearly where it says, this particular soul of an idol was taken from one of the principal images of, so it describes here them going around destroying uh, temples and and, uh, uh, and then he says, you know, uh, once they removed the, the images, their removal cannot have failed to dispel some of the untold darkness and superstition in the minds of many thousands of people, blah, blah, blah. But then they go on to describe it very precisely of, um, of how it, where it was inside the statue. So it said, this particular soul of an idol was taken from one of the principal images. Uh, it is made of thin pieces of gold and silver, small pearls and stones, uh, and it's eight inches in length. It is not hung on the outside of the image as decoration might be, but in the hollow chest of the idol, which is uh, spe specially constructed to receive it, a religious ceremony of exceptional importance is performed uh, to, to consecrate it, uh, blah, 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 and it goes on. I mean, uh, it's, and then it gives all of the same kind of symbolic correlations of the uh, elements and the colors and directions and all of that that we know from uh, Chinese correlative kind of cosmology and making those connections. So here they are side by side, unmistakably uh, the same thing with the writing, uh, with the um, even labeling the organ, uh, organs of the body with the lungs, uh, spleen, and I'm not sure why they use the shank character on the two other lobes, but uh, one, two, three, four, five would have been the representations of the five uh, organs. Um, so that was really uh, quite interesting to um, uh, to be able or to really confirm that indeed those uh, materials were being sent back um, and that the missionary accounts uh, were so robust. And then here uh, in the at the Pitt Rivers Museum, I just made a quick uh, spin through there, but in the ca in one of the cases, just filled with all kinds of icons. It was a little harder to to do anything because it's all glassed in, but I sort of could get a shot around the backside of one where you can see the uh, uh, ca a cavity that had been where the gesso is just being revealed a little bit on the back side of it there. Now, 
my point here is that uh, that uh, even from very early on, even though we still today scholars are expressing surprise at finding these things, even in a newspaper like the New York Times, uh, dating back to 1926, had an interesting article about that was titled "Rare Tokens Found Stuffed in a Buddha," uh, and uh, describes the hollow chest of this uh, of this cavity. Here's the full report on it, and it describes um, uh, uh, precisely how when uh, this they were moving it for um, after it had been uh, sold at auction or preparing it for auction. He says, when it was lifted up, the hollow chest of the Oriental God was found to be stuffed with manuscripts. There were seven large Chinese prayer books, uh, each containing several hundred feet of invocations uh, in Chinese script, illustrated with pictures. Uh, the binding uh, of, of one contained remains of fine Chinese silk uh, and so on. So here we know, and, and what happens to all of these, um, uh, these manuscripts and the materials from them is just uh, is totally unknown today, unfortunately. Um, but nonetheless, they had all of this information uh, that also included uh, other things that were inside there, including uh, bits of mica, pearls, uh, chips of cedar. Remember the other ones that we read about had uh, bits of minerals uh, and also incense uh, inside of them, uh, including uh, uh, crystals and other uh, things like that. So, uh, so this report then, again, going all the way back to 1926, um, uh, is something to take note of, of just how early on people uh, uh, knew about this practice. Um, the first academic article that I could find on this um, of somebody who was a curator uh, publishing on this was uh, from 1927, just a year after the New York Times article, Helen uh, Fernald, uh, published um, uh, this first one and she had been a, was a curator at the University of Pennsylvania Museum and published on this dry lacquer uh, Buddhist image uh, that was found to be uh, filled with a variety of materials um, when they were studying the construction uh, techniques of the of the image uh, and they uh, um, found all this material in it. And she doesn't really um, focus too much on the contents because they were uh, more concerned with the construction techniques and finding the date of the image. Uh, but nonetheless, she writes, um, she says, it might be hoped that among the papers found in the statue would be something to indicate the identity of the figure. But apparently these books are merely portions of sutras or Buddhist scriptures. Um, and then she goes on and uh, and um, and also says that uh, together um, that uh, also inside of it um, were bags of perfumed ashes uh, and a small parcel containing the five organs made in silver, but very rudimentary. And so just in this incidental comment uh, and then passes over. We don't know, you can see in the picture on the right, the scrolls uh, bound up uh, um, and, and stacked together there. Uh, and so one hopes that these are still somewhere in the museum. The, the first time I tried to find them, I couldn't uh, locate them, but uh, hopefully they're, they're still there somewhere. Um, the next uh, um, major um, sort of publication on this, at least academic publication, was by Robert Hawkins, um, uh, uh, an art historian at Princeton University, um, who uh, studied uh, this uh, a Chinese gilded uh, wood statue of a seated Guanyin and its contents uh, that were in the Princeton University Art Museum. And in the full research report, Hawkins, who uh, seems to have been um, attuned to the fact that a statue might have things in it because he cites the work of, of Helen Fernald, and uh, again, he hopes that the contents of the statue would also assist him in dating uh, this image. But he noted that, quote, what few uh, reliable dates we have for the sculptures and wood executed after the fall of the Tang dynasty have come about through the practice of making cavities in the back of the statue in which magic or symbolic materials were placed. The contents of these cavities might include a record of the making or repairing of the image, or an inscription might be written on the plug of wood which sealed the cavity, end of quote. And so he, he went on and, and listed quite a number of other statues uh, in other museum collections um, that he was aware of uh, when he wrote in 1953. And remember that this, um, 
uh, that this is happening uh, around the time then we're still uh, around the time when that Sevi Oji image was uh, was first found. But these were Western uh, curators that knew quite a lot about what about statues with uh, materials inside of them. So, for example, he mentioned this Guanyin image. Uh, again, notice the dates around the 11th and 12th century. Um, this one in Toronto that contained in incense and cloth viscera, according to the uh, reports. Um, this uh, wonderful image, again, from the Met, uh, from uh, uh, 13th century, again, of a Guanyin uh, that has its uh, uh, an inscription on the plug of the cavity, uh, but also the uh, cataloging note. This one, you can see there's two cavities, one in the uh, torso and then one down below as well, uh, included colored silk organs, again, uh, seeds, incense, and precious stones. So um, then uh, again, at the um, take us back to London uh, at the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, this Guanyin image uh, from uh, 1200 uh, that in the cataloging note says uh, that when this scripture, when this sculpture arrived at the museum, uh, it contained a lac lacquer box with offerings of silks, gauze, grain, and a bronze mirror. And then again, on that same visit, uh, when I went to the British Museum, uh, made a trip to the Victoria and Albert and Ricardo Brosh uh, very kindly uh, uh, agreed to uh, let me look through a lot of the cataloging notes and then also some of the material uh, that was in storage. And sure enough, that lacquer box uh, with the materials inside of it was still in the in the collection. And this shows uh, the, uh, the cloth uh, symbol uh, five colors of the viscera and the other organs and a bronze mirror and a small bell uh, that was included with it. And these uh, interestingly had um, uh, these um, uh, the inscriptions noting uh, different repairs that were done to it uh, at different time periods um, uh, that um, uh, stretched uh, from uh, the very, uh, the first one was in 1374, uh, and then there was another one, a repair that was done in 1417. Um, this one's a little bit fragmentary, it's hard to see, but you can see the date here uh, of the Silue, and then uh, it has the person's name, uh, Liu Yuan Ming, and then it's, uh, uh, then it describes it, it was uh, uh, repaired at that time. This one's a little bit clearer uh, from the Yongla period of the Ming. Uh, this is 1417. Um, after all the dates here, then you have that this uh, Guanyin Tang, Bichoni, the, uh, the nun from the Guanyin Tang, um, her name is Jingman, and then she Chongxiu, so she then uh, um, uh, repaired it again at that time. So um, uh, again, we, there's another uh, Guanyin image uh, from the 13th century, again, where you see the cavity. This one I don't know about the where the contents uh, presently are. Um, but in uh, again, just to uh, to show again uh, back to Japan in the collection of the Kanagawa uh, Prefectural Museum also has a seated Guanyin again from this about the same time period from the 11th and 12th century. Uh, um, uh, that included cloth human organs again, it's noted in the collection notes and incense inside of it as well. And indeed this one we have images of the of the viscera that were in there uh, um, uh, that are shown on the right there. Um, just a, a quick, just to show you a few more, if one digs a little bit deeper in these, this Akshobia image, again, from a little later from the Ming, uh, that said it contained fragrant wood seeds, mother of pearl, lapis lazuli, rock crystal, and sutra fragments. And I hated every time that I would come across this note that it said sutra fragments, and no details are given whatsoever about what sutras, uh, where those uh, objects uh, and uh, documents presently are. Uh, and so uh, it's really, I think, uh, time uh, to reassess all of these extant images that are in museum uh, collections and their contents uh, to see if there's any way uh, to uh, put some of this back together, or at least see if any of the images still have materials or they're in other parts of the collection. Uh, this, uh, just to, uh, again from the Ming, uh, this one we know a little bit more about. This is a child attendant of Guanyin uh, that had been opened up at the Seattle Art Museum, and you can see um, the same uh, variety of things that are inside of there. And then in, in 1957, uh, Time Magazine even, I mean, to uh, just to show you how this was leaking out into the popular press, Time Magazine even had an article about this uh, golden boy al also at the Seattle Art Museum and describes the opening it up of how the curator uh, put the boy face down uh, and used his small knife uh, uh, to uh, cut where the layer of gesso was uh, and, um, 
After 30 minutes, uh, he took off this rectangular section of the back of it and poked inside and he pulled out crumbling paper with writing in Tibetan uh, and uh, raw silk, strips of colored cloth, a chain of silver emblems, a bronze mirror, uh, silk bag uh, made up uh, in the shape of a human stomach containing all these, uh, a variety of metal wood seeds and beads and things like that. So here again, we get this mixture of, of textual material, uh, cloth, uh, metal, and, uh, uh, and also uh, um, uh, sometimes stone and things like that. Moving forward in dates to the 17th century, again, back to the uh, Victorian Albert Museum. Uh, there's also, so these aren't all just Buddha images as well, or Buddhist images, uh, but we also have uh, Chinese uh, popular gods like Guan Di. Um, again, uh, they're um, uh, no cataloging notes on this one as far as I can tell, but uh, this one uh, also uh, had uh, contents inside of it uh, that range from these kind of symbolic metal uh, working things to a bronze mirror, all kinds of seeds and other uh, cloth uh, materials put inside of there. And then what looked to be the shape of, of some of the uh, 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 of the Wuzang or the five uh, viscera uh, organs as well, some of them in a bell. And again, thanks to, um, to Ricarda, we could see that in their uh, storage, they actually have all of this. And this shows you uh, the baskets uh, of the stuff lined up. And if I just show you this here, you can see the bell here. Uh, these are the metal objects uh, here. And then all of the seeds uh, here and these funny shaped things. I'm not sure exactly what all, all of these uh, necessarily are, but hopefully we'll be able to do more work and uh, uh, analysis and, and on those uh, at a future date. Um, so, uh, now, just to show uh, a few more of these um, of, of why the um, material in China is a little bit more difficult to get a hold of is uh, the destruction of things. But there were a few that had earlier archaeological reports that allow us to know what was inside of them on of these uh, Chinese statues in situ. So this is from the uh, the Zhihua Si in Beijing, uh, uh, dated to the 13th or 14th century. And again, when it was um, originally uh, the, the base of it was being repaired and the images are really horrible in the archaeology archaeological report, but they found that, that it had these uh, cavities, uh, had a cavity inside of it that had all of this material put in it. And in fact, it had a large number of, of scrolls, um, uh, of uh, Buddha Sutra scrolls and other materials that were in there uh, that they just call, um, you know, that they don't specify what the titles of anything are. And they merely, uh, in the report, there's a lot of coins as well, uh, they merely summarize in their um, report here that it says that in total, uh, that there were uh, uh, 31 dran of Buddhist uh, sutras that were inside of it, and then all the coins and everything. So again, a very intriguing uh, kind of information, but uh, doesn't tell us uh, much uh, in detail. But they fortunately, in a different report, I was able to find, we can see some of the printed editions of, um, of the text there, like the Fu Fazang Yin Yuan Dran. And uh, you get a lot of the editions of, of Lotus Sutra, like you find here. Uh, but nonetheless, it would be nice to be able to, um, to assess uh, that entire uh, collection. Um, I, I, at present, I don't know what uh, happened to these 31 Dran of, of text. Um, uh, hopefully they're still uh, preserved uh, somewhere. Here's a uh, part of the Lotus Sutra that one that was found in there as well. In a different uh, report, um, this one uh, was quite interesting as well, where it uh, describes um, uh, the opening or th this uh, set of statues um, uh, here uh, that um, when uh, they did uh, these uh, scans of them, they found that they had these hollow cavities so that when it describes them doing the Samyal, they, they, they discovered that each of the statues in their chest cavity uh, uh, had uh, materials in, that had been put inside of them. But then it says, Kushi. <laughs> this is a quite a classic phrase. But uh, unfortunately, due to historical circumstance, uh, we all know what that is, the materials that had been inside are no longer uh, visible. They're no longer available. They're no, long, they're no longer extent. So again, uh, um, clearly showing images that had materials but uh, are no longer um, accessible to us. So clearly one of the um, 
as I mentioned above, one of it was due to the iconoclastic periods in Chinese history um, that have have caused these uh, this absence, uh, if you will, that are created an absence in the historical record of what we can know about. But interestingly, some of you may be surprised uh, that the enshrining of things inside of uh, statuary in East Asia is not limited to the Buddhist tradition, even though that seems to be the most uh, prominent. In fact, um, one, one might ask the question, what about Taoism? In fact, it's very rare, uh, at least to find early on any kind of earliest, uh, early textual records of, in, of putting things inside of, of Taoist statues. There's just one short uh, comment in uh, Du Guangting text from uh, the 10th century that describes this, but, but we know it was probably going on much more, even though it doesn't get represented in text. And one never hears about uh, Confucius stat statues having things inside of them, but we uh, have this record um, that a uh, uh, scholar at Tsinghua University, uh, Jing, uh, Jun Jing, had discussed about an image of Confucius um, that was uh, made in, he says, he describes an image of Confucius that was made in North China. And he says, following the custom that, quote, a statue's internal parts must approximate the anatomy of a real person in order to activate the deity's ability to respond to human supplications. Thus, a ruby and an art and artificial pearls were installed in the statue of Confucius to represent his heart and intestines, uh, and then and so on. And then we have this very interesting report uh, from 1966 um, that a scholar by the name of Wang Liang has, has uh, described. And this is a statue that was kept at the Temple of Confucius in Chufu, right in his hometown there. And it says that when the Red Guard stormed into the temple in their iconoclastic fervor to destroy the statue, one of them thrust his hand inside of uh, the, the image. And you can see actually, this is the image of Confucius with the belly uh, broken open, uh, thrust his hand inside. And as he used his strength to make a hollow in old Kongza's belly, others joined in. And from within the hole, they pulled out a bunch of cotton books and the lousy guts of old Confucius, end of quote. Uh, so here, uh, um, it must have shocked them even more. I mean, if you're you're doing your iconic, you know, uh, destroying the statue to find that it was actually something that act had human organs uh, inside of it, making it even a, a further abomination in their eyes. So what this led to uh, was, um, and I think I'm uh, probably getting close to uh, time here, um, was then to run a number of projects. And I think I, I saw maybe a few people who might've been on one of these uh, 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 in collaboration with the Frog Bear Project uh, out at UBC uh, to do um, uh, field work in both Korea and Japan and then China. The China uh, we decided to do last, but uh, uh, thanks to uh, some wonderful connections there, um, this opened up a whole world of, uh, at least to me, and I, I think um, uh, of scholarship and actual uh, materials uh, in Korea uh, that was literally mind blowing. Um, and uh, so they gave us incredible access to uh, materials in the uh, National Museum of Korea and also at many of the different temples to show, to look at the uh, uh, manuscripts and other objects that have been placed inside of them, some from the uh, from the temples like Sudoksa and very generous to show uh, the types of materials that are in there. And uh, it was uh, really uh, quite shocking to me to realize how much excellent scholarship there was uh, done by uh, scholars in Korea about this material, uh, but so little that had been um, uh, translated or was made available to kind of international scholarly audience, except for the Korea specialist, which uh, um, uh, seemed to be uh, kind of a shame given how much was known about uh, the material in Japan. And so it, some of these even list the exact objects that should be, this is one thing we're lacking from on the Chinese side are, are real descriptions of everything that should go inside. But we have this record uh, from, uh, uh, from a Korean image uh, that details uh, all the objects that should go in. And one of those scholars uh, by the name of Song Ilgye uh, had produced an incredible, I thought, uh, um, article uh, detailing all of the rare um, uh, Buddhist sutras uh, that had been discovered inside of statues uh, in, in Korea uh, and uh, had been, uh, just when they were found, um, immediately classified as national treasures. And many of these are in print, but also in manuscript form and some in, in movable type. In any case, you get a kind of list of, get a sense of what of what all of that is. Many of these uh, 
uh, he, he shows uh, were actually no longer extant in Korea. And so this is the only surviving version of them as well. So the importance of the icon as a kind of preserver uh, of materials as well. So I, I have written about some of that before as a kind of internal archive. Uh, we might think of it that way. Uh, and similarly in Japan, the things that come out. So uh, for those, I'll put in a plug for those who are interested in the Korean Pokjong tradition, uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, Song Hye Lee, myself and Yunmi Kim edited a volume of essays on this entire, on all the different practices uh, of image consecration in Korea, all translated into English. Um, and you'll be shocked to find that it's not just images that had uh, these consecrated items. Uh, there's some fascinating chapters on how paintings actually had a pouch that was uh, either would have been put on the front, but then moved to the back uh, that were when paintings were also received a consecration, uh, um, just like uh, icons did. Uh, most recently, um, Keith Wilson down at the um, Freer Sackler had put on a uh, actually a, a symposium. This was my last trip before the lockdown. Um, this was in late February of this year, uh, where they uh, uh, did a really wonderful uh, day long symposium about this Avalokiteshvara image and had many of the scholars that contributed to that uh, Kaide Extremazi volume um, uh, just to bring attention to it, had it on display, and then also did a, a dedication ritual the following day. Uh, with a master who's well known for this Pokchang tradition, which is alive and well in Korea and actually quite uh, prominent again. Um, and then the, the, the year after Korea, we went to Japan uh, to do research on uh, on images there. And uh, here, it's kind of funny to look at this all with masks on back then. And, and this is in the Kanazawa Bunko storage room uh, for wearing masks for totally other reasons to protect the materials, but also very generous uh, uh, scholars uh, giving uh, their time and expertise to look at some of the Japanese uh, materials. And then uh, this included a symposium with Abe Yasuro, uh, Chikamoto Kensuke, uh, Oku Takeo, very famous scholar of, of that material, um, and uh, uh, Nagaoka Ryusaku as well, and Akira Akiyama all participated in uh, to contextualize it on, on the Japanese side, of looking at the materials. But I, I don't have time to go into it, but for those who are familiar with the Japanese material, realize the, the, just the bulk of material that survives in those. And, and uh, it's just absolutely astounding uh, to see the, the enormous range of textual material and manuscript that's inside of those. Uh, some wonderful resources for studying the Japanese material um, like this uh, uh, collection and, and there's many others. I just uh, put it up here just to show you, but the catalog uh, or these the indices to these in themselves are incredibly helpful uh, just to show the number of entries of texts and other materials. So. So I'll end with um, uh, very quickly here, just, just to show you the variety of things that one finds in turn uh, that are put inside of statue from relics to sutras, dharani, organs, uh, mandalas, materia medica, mirrors, coins, all of this. Um, and we really, uh, I think now have this moment to be able to study uh, uh, these in a different way now that with new uh, scanning technology, but hopefully now with, uh, uh, now that people are more aware of the fact of what types of things can be be put inside, hopefully, uh, museum collections, and uh, we'll, we'll make some of that material more available to us as well. Let me, let me just end to take us back to SOAS really quickly. Um, you'll recall these little images that I showed you from the British Museum. One of the unsung heroes in this story, I think, is a scholar by the name of Keith Stevens that some people may know the name of, maybe not. He was a British foreign officer, but he had studied at SOAS, got his degree from SOAS, and then went off and served in the military, and then became a really uh, kind of a, a private scholar and was super interested in these small statues. This is him in his office at home uh, with the images you can see on the bookshelves here. And he was actually uh, the first uh, uh, foreign scholar that I know of to actually publish on these small votive images and he, he published a number of articles that are today still hard to find but on on, on really uh, cool topics like um, uh, like uh, cults that are found among uh, uh, people who uh, are boat people in Hong Kong for example and, and the images that they keep on their boats for example for safety and all of that so his collection was massive um, and not to end on a sad note but he um, uh, this was his great, this was the one book he kind of published on a lot of this material, um, interestingly called Fo Xiang, Shan Xiang. So uh, Buddhist images and God images uh, here, often even those small ones are referred to Buddhist images. In any case, he, um, uh, uh, 
when he passed away in 2015, I had hoped so much to uh, see if there was a way to keep that collection together of over a thousand images that he had. But unfortunately, it went up for auction in 2016. And now those images are dispersed uh, all over, presumably all over uh, 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 Europe, I would, I would assume. But it seems as if one of the major buyers was somebody uh, in Singapore, Malaysia. I'm, I'm hoping, I don't know if anybody out there knows how to get in touch with or, or track down these kind of people. Uh, if, if there's a large collection it would be there wasn't enough time before he passed away to actually catalog the entire collection though I have screenshots of the entire auction um, so this is these these the ones that I uh, opened up with this is uh, uh, again these take us into the level of kind of popular uh, religion which I won't uh, uh, continue with today but um, this is where uh, we have a huge number of these uh, something on the order of eight to nine thousand uh, where we have uh, photographs and all of the documents scanned on these and where religion comes together uh, Buddhist Taoist local practices uh, cults to gods you've never heard of and all of that kind of thing uh, and so that'll be uh, the topic of another day or uh, my colleague Alana Aro at the um, Ecole Francaise has just also published a book on these entitled uh, Cultic Images in China uh, on some of the earlier collections. So why don't I stop there, uh, Lucia, and be happy to um, take any questions or uh, talk with people about this. So thank you. Should I go ahead and un... Uh, I think you're muted. Um, so should I go ahead and... Un yes, thank you. I was just saying thank you. Try to okay. close. Um, thank you for a wonderful talk, but for sharing with us such a, a wealth of material to, to make us aware of such a wealth of material. Having worked uh, in Japan for many years, I, I, I know in more details the, the Japanese material, but uh, I, I'm, I was surprised to see the amount of uh, um, Chinese stuff. Well, of course, it shouldn't be surprising. I mean, the Seiryuji statue is supposed to come from China, right? The, the narrative about the statue is uh, that of a Chinese uh, um, image. So it's in, in a sense that rings a lot of bells, but it's really interesting to see it uh, um, as a, as a Pan-Asian uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, I'd heard a little bit from Yumi Kim's research about Korea and it's kind of uh, um, the, the materials are so, so different and uh, the the um, yeah what we can get the, the kind of, what the statues archive uh, mm -hmm. uh, is very very interesting. But and I must say that I was surprised to see how much stuff is in London, <laughs> is around the museums in London, and even downstairs at Soas. That's uh, that's uh, uh, another uh, uh, another reason to regret to, <laughs> that you are not here. We could have uh, seen a lot of this stuff uh, uh, together, but uh, uh, I'm sure there would be other chances. Uh, um, this is a, a wonderful yeah. project. Carry, to carry out uh, many hands. Yeah, actually, I should um, just mention really briefly one of the notes in the comments, which I should have mentioned on that, um, uh, the um, metal uh, work piece from the from the British Museum. Um, I actually think it was uh, perhaps the, the missionaries that might have actually written the organ names on top of there. So what they had done, the two uh, sides that had the Xi'an character, in fact, are miswritten uh, characters for the kidney. So that that oh, yes. uh, is exactly so that that was probably I mean, the script is looks a bit funky on there anyway. Anyway, so um, just to, uh, uh, they probably were learning what those things were and, and labeled them perhaps, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Uh, right, so what we will do, uh, I, I will uh, um, uh, rel relish my, my usual chair privilege to ask the first question perhaps and see okay. uh, what the questions uh, on, uh, on the uh, Q&A are. Um, and uh, I need a second, perhaps. I'm joined here by my colleague Stefania Travagnin, who will uh, uh, also help. But I I'd seen a long question from Stuart Young. Maybe I'll start about that because it was something I was going to ask. And Stuart says, uh, is curious about silk. What silk is doing inside images? Uh, that materials here have different functions, medicinal, lapotropaic, karmic, symbolic, practical, uh, fine. Might be fine, uh, but how might how might silk fit in? What is the range of kinds of silk items placed in the statues? Are any relation to the silks that often adorn statues ex externally, robes and such? Uh, connection to silk in mortuary practices? Uh, how corpses were wrapped? Something like that, and connection to silk as dana. 
Um, and finally, is there, uh, have you seen the textual discussions uh, of uh, why silk is used in statues specifically? What do you think? Yeah, great, Stuart. Um, well, Stuart is the master of all things silk in my mind. So I'm, I was hoping he would uh, be able to answer his own question there, but I think he's touching on a lot of things. There's no descriptions of why uh, silk that I know of, but, um, but in fact, one of the big areas of research on these statues and going all the way back to that initial article by Henderson and Hurwitz, the, the things that interested them were not the text. Um, it was the textiles actually, uh, because they had some very rare uh, fabrics that were inside of them that seem to have been Central Asian uh, making. In fact, there's a lot of study of those textiles. And um, so, uh, there, in fact, uh, the archaeological or the, the reports that I um, uh, put up of some of the Chinese reports, indeed, they weren't interested in the text either. The one I showed of the uh, 31 dran of text that were inside of them, that was a, a report that was uh, entirely about the textiles that was in them as well, or, or uh, the silk that was used on the pedestal that it was sitting on. And so there seems to have been, there's, there's places out there uh, where the research has been done on these um, that I think would be, uh, that you could explore. Um, in the uh, Calle de Extreme Muse uh, issue that uh, is just out on the Korean tradition, however, uh, Yunmi Kim has an article in there about the clothing uh, put inside of, uh, used clothing, uh, um, silk robes and things that were put inside of uh, Korean statues. And uh, she has a, you know, an argument about why that was the case. These are a very high royalty and, and elite figures uh, who put uh, sort of like a kind of, uh, you know, relic of themselves that, that, and the reason for them, you know, actually having been worn, uh, then put inside of the statue. But um, so I, I don't know, we actually, you know, uh, everything uh, that's put inside clearly has symbolic value, some kind of meaning. And I think it's really important to ask exactly the types of questions you're asking here. And, and, but, but, in, but in addition to that, if, if we don't have have, uh, you know, consecration texts that, uh, that really tell us what that is, even if we can't, um, you know, figure it out necessarily, there's still um, important reasons to now combine the kind of work that we do in humanistic scholarship with people working in the sciences right now. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, ways uh, to use the resources or what's inside of these statues for other types of questions uh, to study uh, textiles, but also uh, paper making, the, the different uh, forms of paper, uh, kinds of paper uh, that are, uh, that are um, the manuscripts are written on and, and all of that. The Materia Medica is a whole other uh, um, a huge issue um, that uh, for, at least for the smaller statues that uh, um, Alan Alro and I've been working on, we, we did a little experiment and brought uh, samples of those to a pharmacology college in Paris to uh, get everything identified. And, and it was quite amazing how the variety of stuff that's in there, um, just in terms of the herbs and, and uh, um, uh, minerals and things like that, which uh, are Chinese medicinals that were, uh, that were put inside there. Then the question is, why do you put uh, medicines inside, right? That's a whole other question. So in any case, it leads off into a number of directions uh, that range from paper to textiles to materia medica uh, to manuscripts uh, and all of that. So, but I, in other words, I don't have a great answer for all of your questions about silk, but I hope to uh, stay in touch with you, Stuart, and, and talk about it more sometime and tell me what you think. Um. Uh, yes, actually, uh, there are more questions about uh, what is put inside and why, especially. So we have a couple of people who want to know uh, why mirror, uh, a bronze, bronze mirror, or why other medical substances and why living insects. And I suppose here, if I can, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, there are several of these questions. So I'm not uh, mentioning one by one, but I think what we can uh, okay. talk about is really, um, can we, what is your supposition about uh, uh, yeah. different range of objects that are inside? Okay. So there's no one uh, key to answer all of these type of questions. Um, and in fact, there's probably a range of reasons why, and different ritual manuals are gonna give different uh, um, reasons. And it ranges regionally across China, and it also ranges 
uh, regionally across Asia. So one of the uh, things is to be very, uh, that we, I actually had to attune myself to be careful about was not making assumptions about a similar practice, similar practices that ranged across from uh, uh, China, Japan, Korea. Um, uh, and uh, it gets a little complicated, but even just the, the issue of the five colors that are represented in there, you know, in some cases, this is uh, symbolic uh, representation of the viscera. That's uh, very clear in, in some of them. In other cases, and in many of the Korean statues, um, it has nothing to do with the viscera, but is uh, really related more to esoteric Buddhist symbolism and uh, uh, is, is, is a totally different context. Um, so not all of them are about uh, what we might think of as, say, enlivening it of, of, a, uh, of an image through uh, the putting of symbolic uh, viscera inside of it. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a, um, you'll read different things in different manuals or in, in other scholarship about, for example, uh, the mirror. Uh, I think it was even in the record of one of the missionaries uh, that he uh, reported where, um, you know, the mirror uh, represents uh, the mind, right? So we often, you know, it's a, uh, quite a common metaphor that you find in, in meditation texts and other things too of the uh, of the mirror uh, being uh, like the mind. And uh, so you'll get those. Um, you will sometimes see, I saw that somebody had commented about seahorses. They, they probably saw one in that uh, image there. Um, so you get, uh, uh, actually, this is a good chance to answer the question about um, small animals or insects that are put in there. Um, so in, again, in different regions and in different statues, you'll find uh, little um, either spiders or a small, uh, uh, a small lizard um, that's put in there, um, salamanders, uh, bees, for example, uh, like a, um, uh, uh, are often put inside. And so, uh, and yes, seahorses as well. Some of these, it seems, and again, based on uh, more contemporary ethnographic work, um, where a live animal is put inside of there and, and when it dies, it imparts the uh, life to the soul of the statue. It's part of the enlivening uh, ritual. And this is common, you find this in um, actually in early uh, Mediterranean religions too, uh, you find a similar practice of uh, putting uh, small animals inside. But in other cases, it may not, that the description or the understanding of this is different. And it's a, uh, um, sometimes it's a play on words of the name of the, if it's a bee or a, a wasp or something, the fung, uh, to enfief something um, is also a reason uh, for that as well. Uh, I've heard different explanations about the seahorse. Some people uh, have described it as being like a, a small uh, dragon. So it has that, it looks like a little, you know, dragon. So it has all the associations that come uh, with that as well. But in any case, it's very complicated to map it all out. And there are just different explanations and different texts for what's going on with the, with the animals and insects. Right, right. So if it is not unleavening an image, which is really the main argument made by Japanese scholars, on, uh, on, on the, uh, including uh, uh, viscera or uh, objects that are of that, that are not necessarily devotional objects, let's say, uh, what, what would be the other uh, possible explanation for putting stuff in? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, as part, you know, all of these are part of a Kai Guang ritual or, mm -hmm. right, the the eye-opening ritual and are put in at the time of that, uh, um, when that ritual is performed. So there is a kind of activation of, of, the, of the image through this um, that goes with the dotting of the, externally, the dotting of the eyes of the statue as well. And so, um, I mean, that even the, the, the sort of title for today, I kind of, you know, is a, a loosely related to the Zonai no Nuhin, the Japanese version of that, uh, to adorn something from the inside. And, and I think the, the notion, I mean, in a more general sense, even if whether the symbolism is all adding up to a kind of enlivenment or not, um, is making something special that people know that there are these, uh, uh, on the one hand, making something special with the uh, materials that are uh, put inside but also creating a kind of connection. Um, and those are the, the, where I think the, the manuscript um, becomes really valuable for us in terms of uh, 
um, getting to different types of historical sources because those uh, often name, um, as you saw in the one, uh, nuns and women. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, that Seidioji one is filled with information about the nuns who, who, uh, who uh, did the sewing of the, uh, of the organs for it. Um, and so uh, you, it does open up a kind of world like that, uh, that Christian image that I showed too, where uh, you get some uh, kind of local history even or other types of uh, uh, historical records that just aren't available to us. In addition to all the kind of variants of manuscripts and things like that. I always wondered, this was a big question and this is related to what you just asked is, how did they choose what to put in, what text to put inside, right? So yeah. some people thought, oh, the, oh yeah, just, you know, this would be a place to, uh, just to get rid of, you know, text we have a lot of. And you might think, oh yeah, just throw, you know, a fascicle of the Lotus Sutra in there, blah, 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 you know, um, and maybe some, uh, uh, you know, just toss whatever's, you know, in excess inside of there for the consecration. There's clearly some of that because you get a lot of packing of the space to fill the cavity that are like a lot of uh, Durrani texts, uh, mandalas, things like that, yeah. uh, that are reproduced, or a lot of these in Japan, they call an inbutsu, right? These little mass produced uh, images of, of Buddhas that are just masses and masses of that kind of paper put inside of there. But when you read, the, if it's true for uh, China and, and Japan, as it is for Korea, the fact that this report by Song Yul Gay uh, tracking and looking at those, those were actually really quite rare uh, texts that were put inside as well. So it wasn't the ones that were most commonly uh, reproduced. Otherwise, there would have been others of those around too. And yet he's finding, you know, unique examples of them inside of those texts. They so. can be very much connected to personal circumstances of the donors of the, of the, of the stage itself or something of that type. Yeah. It, it, it certainly could be, yeah. Um, I, I want you to refer back from some of the questions. Um, Akiko Walid notes that the, uh, the metallic uh, uh, sort of viscera that you showed the, the, in the soul of a Chinese idol is, the shape of, is in the shape of the Abhisheka ceremony metal flag, the country mm. Japanese. That's quite interesting. And she says that perhaps also the Serioji Shaka included the Kanjoban uh, together with the silk organs. Yeah. Um, that that's, uh, that that shows some something else. I mean, the Abhisheka, uh it's a different type of ceremony. It's not about the consecration of the statues and uh, the fact that uh, yeah, maybe there is already a lot of esoteric Buddhism in the understanding of the five viscera, as you were also drawing on. But uh, can we say can we say something else about the specific uh, uh, link to the tantric practice? Yeah, I, you know, the, um, I, I've wondered about those, you know, tracking down those shapes and things like that as well. And those, um, the, the best information that we have now are in some of the articles about the Korean material, because, so the reason why the Korean material is so um, valuable in my view is that they, um, in Korea is preserved a consecration uh, manual. It's made up of a number of different, um, uh, a number of different consecration texts, five of them all kind of put together and called the Cho Sang Yong. And uh, this uh, was, well, there are different um, ways to think about it. One is that it's very precise in terms of describing the uh, symbolic associations, what should be put in. And uh, there's, a, there's a couple of good articles in the, in that, uh, um, in the journal uh, that unpack uh, the information from that uh, ritual manual. And it goes in a couple of different directions. On the one hand, uh, there's a strong esoteric Buddhist, Buddhist element and a number of those scholars point that out for the Korean side. And, and indeed it, it's unmistakable in, in some of the small uh, uh, objects that are put inside with uh, Siddham uh, in, around the inside in five directions and, and all of that, that it makes it very clear. Um, but it seems that others are connected to a kind of Huayan tradition that Rick McBride um, writes about uh, um, based on what uh, the, the kind of transformations that happen. It may be a, a slow transformation over time in Korea, kind of moving from esoteric into the Huayan stuff. But um, in any case, uh, um, that it's, it's still uh, um, looking at all of those uh, symbolic uh, shapes, particularly of the metal uh, sort of, I'm not sure what to call them. They're kind of hanging, not really a pendant, but some kind of a, um, 
uh, thing where they're, they're actually would have been strung together with five of them with the different shapes um, uh, is, is something I, I, it's very standard across the different ones uh, to see those shapes and, and uh, but I've never seen a, a precise explanation of why those particular ones, so. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question earlier on about uh, uh, the possibility of adding uh, stone statues inside the uh, whether bronze or, um, or wooden statues. Have you seen anything like that? Uh... That's a good question. I don't know about stone. There are many images inside of images. This is kind of a cool thing. So if some of you may be aware of the big Shotoku uh, exhibition that happened at Harvard of, of, of the Sedgwick image, um, Ellery Sedgwick's family image of Shotoku that had all those materials inside of it. Equally, uh, a curious collection of materials inside of there too. Very hard to try to, uh, people have been working for years trying to figure out that, but also very important uh, information again about um, women practitioners, nuns, things like that. Um, but that also has small, um, I can't remember, ex uh, there's like a, um, uh, um, there's a, a very, very, very small kind of a, a wooden image that's inside of that as well. One of the, um, one of the images from the Lingyan Si also had a statue inside of it, but I, um, gosh, if somebody would have to correct me, but it, I believe it's of wood. Um, though for some reason I'm uh, hedging a little bit on that. I have to go back and look at the report again. I, um, uh, but yes, there, it's very common to find um, or to have these uh, images that are uh, multiple images inside of a, of a statue. Um, I think there's a very famous one of the, um, that Hank Glassman studied of that Jizo image in, in Japan as well that has a, um, a small image in it as, uh, as well. Right. Um, there are lots and lots of very interesting questions. So I'm not sure what to do, but I'll, I'll just put down a couple of them, um, a couple of comments. Does repetition and copying figure in this practice? Uh, Shane McCausland asks. Um, another question is about what do you think about reinserting the material in, uh, in the context of a museum uh, yeah. uh, own to this material and maybe you can do something together with the Buddhist representatives. She's kind of interesting. Um, other yeah. questions are about the historical period. Sorry, I'm saying it to just all of them so that you can decide the historical, whether there is a specific historical period in which the practice maybe occurred. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let me try to bundle those. Should I take those first of all? <laughs> See, I just, yeah, um, yeah. I'll do, I'll, I can do, I think, pretty quickly. Yeah. So the, um, you know, there's actually been a lot of scholarship on the kind of um, multiplication and replication on the, for, particularly for the Japanese, the inputs of images, a lot of Japanese scholarship on that, and a graduate student at Berkeley who's doing a dissertation on precisely that topic. Um, and uh, one finds a similar uh, type of uh, repetition of, of, of mantras and doranis and mandalas in, in the Korean statues. You don't, I haven't seen as much um, from the ones uh, from the Chinese material um, that have that, uh, but in any case, it's a big part of I think the uh, the real devotional side of uh, of the practice of of kind of a catchy end type of a, a phenomenon of creating a, a connection with the with the with the image. Um, somebody had asked, uh, what was the other question? Um, about oh, putting things back inside. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So. Um, so this is a, obviously gets into some really, I think, uh, kind of sensitive terrain too of just how to handle or deal with these types of, of materials. Um, and we're, we're sort of bound to uh, dealing with those images which are either uh, removed from their ritual context or are in museums or already had materials taken out of them. For all of the ones that I've worked on personally, um, uh, a collector who's about 1,200 images, uh, actually in another one with about uh, another 2,000 or so, um, those were all in a, in, in a private collector who agreed to allow them to be um, opened, materials taken out, uh, photographed, uh, scanned all the materials, and then everything put back inside again. Um, and uh, so I think it is important, uh, you know, to do that, to keep everything together for future scholars and also uh, to keep the integrity of things. What, what clearly happened in a lot of the early uh, collections uh, was that the contents became separated from the images and they're often cataloged totally separately. Um, so I don't know, you know, nowadays what uh, curators might uh, think of this in terms of what uh, uh, should be done, but it, in most cases, it seems to me uh, at least, and in Japan, uh, it's very hard um, 
uh, except for the, the materials. So it, it turns out Oku Takeo, um, who is the one in charge of the Juyo uh, Bunkazai, the important cultural properties, and to sign off on things is that uh, mentioned that the only time they're allowed to open a statue, which is why you see so many CT scans rather than opened images, um, is when an image is deemed to be in dire need of repair. And then you can, um, in the process of doing restoration, you can open it and, and uh, analyze the material. So I think they've been flooded now that you get more, uh, I think, you know, with object or statues with materials in them uh, seem to uh, attract attention and gain value. So uh, I think a lot of places are interested whether their uh, statues have uh, materials inside of them, but that's the only time when they're supposed to do it. Um, so that's why we're mainly dealing with things that are, you know, what museum uh, uh, curators choose to do. And, uh, but my own, um, feeling is that uh, those are the, really the only safe ones that we can, uh, you know, that we should be working with, so. Yeah. Uh, how about pe periods, specific periods in which the period Oh yeah, the periods, yeah. So that's why I was having everybody um, uh, sort of pay attention to the dates. Um, mm -hmm. The ones, if you notice, the earliest ones were metal. Um, uh, that that had had uh, cavities in them, and so having those in the in in the metal ones uh, uh, seems okay, and, and and it may be related to preservation. And I, it's just hard to know uh, because the the wooden ones um, really take off in the. 10th century, 9th, 10th century, and there's a massive explosion for some reason. And again, whether this is related to um, uh, or just skewed by uh, the chance survival of, of these uh, in that are in collections, um, 11th, 12th century, uh, 11th, 12th, 13th century really is when we have the most. Um, and so whether that means that there were more kind of produced at that time is, is, is hard to determine. It may just be uh, um, uh, the, based on collections, or it may be based on survivability of wood over, uh, um, as opposed to metal, and um, and those earlier ones were in metal. So it's it's tricky, but nonetheless, we do have a, a large number, particularly uh, late eleventh uh, and twelfth century. Um, the, I don't know if we, we normally stop at seven, but I I think we can go on a little bit more. Uh, maybe sure, I'm fine. Yeah, I don't care. I've got I got nowhere to be. It's snowing in Boston today. I mean, it's like dumping snow outside. So I'm happy to hang out. And <laughs> oh, <that's so> <laughs> yeah. there are a lot of suggestions for you about specific top, um, things that you mentioned, uh, uh, Roderick. Good. Can you actually can you save the uh, the Q and A or the chat because I'd love to. I can't possibly. Uh, speak and read everything at the same time, but I'd love to learn from everybody and, and, and so see people's suggestions. Sorry, it's also difficult to come back to what exactly you meant. So I think the question on repetition and copying was not really about Japan. I was thinking about the argument made in China, for instance, by, by Shen on, on uh, the practice of copying and reproducing. So it's difficult to, to come back to everything uh, yeah. that written. Um, but there was a very large question here that I think is worth maybe to think a bit about it uh, by San, San Yok Lee, who asks, so what is the implication of these practices for our understanding of East Asian Buddhism? What do they challenge? Mm -hmm. or do they challenge our current understanding in any way? Yeah, good. Hi, Song Yop. Um, I know Song Yop well. Uh, it's a very good question. So this was one of the, um, I'm not sure if it, it it's getting kind of, um, how would I say, uh, the field has changed over the years in terms of what this does in terms of material, right? I mean, if one thinks back to say 20 years ago, um, these kinds of things were maybe even a little bit earlier were quite shocking, right? And, and, and the fact that uh, there would be this kind of uh, animation of Buddhist icons was, uh, was also not uh, easily or well accepted. And, um, and I think we're over that. I mean, and with the impact of people studying uh, relic traditions and all of that that uh, has, have really uh, transformed uh, the field in many ways. And, and there's uh, good scholarship. Um, uh, I think I saw James Dobbins signed on a little bit ago and also who just, just came out with his uh, new book on uh, Behold the Buddha where he tracks a lot of the development of some of this discourse about uh, statues. Um, and, uh, and there's, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of, of things that have come out just in terms of, of, um, of thinking about of living icons and, and actually quite a lot of debate really. Was that really the main purpose? Was it to enliven an image or, uh, or not? And, um, and so uh, there's, 
I'm not sure, you know, at this point, um, uh, whether it challenges anything of our current understanding, um, but I would say it provides new possible resources for, uh, for accessing parts of the Buddhist tradition for which we do not have a very ample textual record for. Um, and, and that's why I think the, um, the access to and preservation of the types of, of documents and inscriptions that are in there, um, in many cases, uh, can, uh, can add something there. Particularly, and I, I you know, the, the, the larger kind of uh, temple type statues, uh, and I would divide these into, there's many different kinds. We can't really lump all this together. So for example, you know, would we learn anything new from just having a, a new edition of a one fascicle of the Lotus Sutra? Perhaps not. Is there a manuscript of the Lotus Sutra that might be of interest? Yes. Um, but when, when, when one goes down to a, the kind of lower level of, of uh, images that are coming off of, of altars uh, inside of people's homes and things like that, which is the, um, the images that I started with that uh, are, are from a particular region in, in Hunan there, um, that, uh, that we are now gaining insight into a totally different level of religious practice um, that uh, gives us a kind of social context that we're often uh, uh, just don't have, have access to. Um, not all of those are just East Asian Buddhists though. Um, they're, it, like I said, those are kind of, um, they're kind of mixed. So, um, so anyway, that's one, you know, one possible way uh, I think to, uh, um, you know, to respond to that type of a question, there's, it, it may provide some nudges in different directions, um, but I think, uh, you know, um, at least among specialists, this, uh, you know, the awareness of, of, of putting materials inside of, of statues during a consecration ritual is, is really uh, nothing new anymore. Um, uh, but we may still learn things about, by reading those documents, that may add to our understanding about how uh, what devotional cults were like, devotional practices, and and how things were how things were used. So, um, yes, indeed, there was also a comment about the fact that the practice is also widespread in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, and most, in this case, mostly as treated as uh, Vajrayana practice that is distinct from Mahayana tradition. So that maybe here we can see, I suppose, cross influences between Tibet and China. Um, and there are other questions about the spreading of this practice, so whether it is practiced today elsewhere than in Korea, since you mentioned cases about Korea, uh, whether you know of anything about uh, China or the Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia. And there was mm -hmm. uh, an example given of a statue made now with the CD room of a, um, what was it, of the Tripitaka thing? Sorry, what was it? What was the second part of that? Um, whether it is a practice uh, also upheld today by the time in China or the, by uh, Chinese, the Chinese diaspora in Southeast Asia. And uh, I hear that I read an example of a statue made with a, um, a CD room inserted in it. I can't oh, find it yeah. I so let me... Um... I can't find it anymore. Um, uh, just very, very briefly, I mean, this, again, um, uh, in terms of the connections with Tibet, I didn't go into it at all, but actually some of the earliest scholarship was on Tibetan images um, uh, and other, uh, particularly uh, Chandra Reddy uh, in, uh, did some a really interesting study of ones at the LA County Museum of Art. And then um, the most important work is Yale Benter, obviously, who's done a, a tremendous amount on the consecration rituals of Tibetan images. So there's a lot to learn about uh, uh, comparing uh, those, uh, the traditions as they extend in Tibet. I just couldn't cover everything possibly uh, today on that. The reach into South, uh, Southeast Asia, yes. Um, I spent some time in Vietnam looking around and, and attended a few uh, statue consecrations there um, as well. Very similar type of a, of a practice uh, with cavities in the back. Uh, Laurel Kendall um, at the American History of Natural Museum has written a little bit on some of those and some of the controversies actually of putting uh, newly consecrated ones on display. And she has a very interesting article on those uh, one of, of just how they are uh, treated as a living 
uh, image, um, or at least were, you know, one of such respect that it has to be treated with deference and an issue of when the museum was uh, preparing an exhibition and uh, one of the ritual masters who had, had done the consecration stopped by the museum to see uh, check on the progress and saw that one of the statues was on the floor as it was being worked on and, and that almost uh, uh, endangered the, uh, the exhibition. So, um, but uh, yes, so the uh, extends down to Vietnam and also into peninsular uh, Southeast Asia too. Um, I've heard about, I've never been there myself, but I've, I know people who have gone um, where there's one temple, I think it's in Penang of a a, a kind of a statue swap place where people who have a statue and this this maybe gets back to your earlier question about why putting all this stuff in there you know it's really all about efficacy too it's about in the Chinese context to make it ling to make it numinous to make it uh, powerful to make it uh, respond and so in Southeast Asia at this place when your statue has been um, lost its power its ling its numinosity then you can bring it to this temple and swap it out for another one you just uh, you leave yours and take another one home and and I also think that helps to account for why in some of the um, uh, the statues that we study when we take the uh, consecration certificates out I'll call them that uh, that we sometimes find multiple uh, consecration where they're done periodically, where uh, the image must have been losing its power and therefore was re-consecrated uh, to give it um, uh, 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 to give it uh, power again. So, yeah. Very interesting. Um, uh, just quickly, questions about uh, uh, the fact that in Japan we also find bodily parts inside the statues, and you have not mentioned that about China. Examples in China and Korea uh, that you know of of uh, statues with bodily parts. Yeah, I mean, if it's a if it's a relic, it's a body part, uh, ostensibly, or at least ideally. I mean, it, they, as we know, relics can be sort of fashioned out of. Uh, uh, we know that they're not always human bodily parts, but uh, you know, I think. Cutting nails of living. Yeah. Nails are not exactly relics. They yeah. Are. Well, I would still I would still classify those as a kind of contact relic, right, of somebody. But nonetheless, um, it's different than say a relic of the Buddha. But you're right, actually, and other scholars know more about this than I. But on the on the Japanese side, you do have this where um, on that list that I showed, and I'm trying to figure out how to make sense of all of the variety of things and sort things out. But um, on the the, 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 your own relic, let's say, as a donor or, or yeah. supported or sponsored, the, the making yep. is slightly different from having all sort of uh, uh, precious uh, gems that, uh, that yep. make you think of the relic of a saint or something like that. The, the, the yeah. dimension there, I would suggest. No, absolutely. I think it's absolutely different. Um, and so, yes, you do um, in the list of if you go through the catalogs of those who study the Zonai no Nuhin and, and all, everything, just even looking at the index to that massive volume, uh, I had I, I basically uh, listed all of the different categories of things that were uh, that were in there. And in addition to hair, you also have like hair combs, women's hair combs, for example, are a very common thing uh, to put inside their uh, fans, um, uh, which isn't a bodily part, obviously, but some that same type of kind of personal uh, uh, connection um, as well. So, um, but I haven't seen that for, um, actually, I might have. Uh, the, what, the closest thing you find in some of the archaeological reports for China um, are bags of ash, um, so there's another set of a very interesting, uh, I didn't show them because there, um, there's some controversy over exactly what they are, but there's these, uh, uh, some wooden statues from Northern China that have a, a cavity in the belly of it that, that was just filled with a bunch of ash. And some people have speculated that that was the ash of the donor uh, that was put in. Um, and so uh, it may actually be, and, and uh, if I can put in a just another plug for a really excellent curator is Donna Strahan, um, who uh, has a very interesting article about how even the lacquer that was um, on the outside of some statues uh, was mixed with bone, uh, sort of bone fragments. Um, when they did some microscopic studies of the lacquer, they found that bone had been mixed into it as well. So again, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, um, really, and it may just be because of the detail of the reports of China uh, versus Japan, um, but there are hints that that kind of material was put in there. We do have a lot that and I had kind of noted a few along the way where we have collections of ash ash that are in there. Mm -hmm. And now you mentioned lacquer and there was another question also about uh, talking about differences or similarities 
uh, the difference or similarities between statues empowered with objects uh, and statues that are actually mum mummies, mummified, uh, covering up the mummified yeah. of uh, of some uh, masters. Yeah, so I, I topic that has been tested for China especially, but it, because you put them together, what what do we, how do we? Yeah, I the only reason I put them together was to um, to sort of make a point at the beginning of how people are often. Uh, shocked or still surprised about finding, uh, you know, something inside of a statue. And that was, you know, kind of a famous case of it. But I, the logic is totally different. They come out of totally, I think, rather separate uh, uh, traditions in China. Um, you know, the the history of, of mummification is well known now by scholars and, and the transition from a natural um, mummification to uh, adding kind of hemp uh, soaked cloth, uh, lacquer soaked uh, or hemp soaked in lacquer to it. But this was really a way to try to control that mummification process. And so you get this evolution uh, towards uh, wrapping and then even gilding on top of that. Um, so I think that's a slightly different thing um, where you're not, uh, the issue wasn't, for me, the issue is what is the, what, what's going on here of hiding, putting things inside of cavities um, that ostensibly were not meant for other people to see later, um, but uh, but were put in and hidden away. And, and the fact that they're gessoed over and then gilded, uh, they're not meant to be reopened. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, is something that um, I think is is an interesting part of it, of just that the kind of hiding of it in there. And um, uh, but I think I do think it's qualitatively different than than say what's going on with with mummification. Mm -hmm. Uh, Stephanie, did I miss some questions? Interesting. Uh, actually, speaking oh. about the meanings, uh, there was also a suggestion that, uh, uh, well, a, a question of whether you are interpreting all this uh, or how you are situating yourself within the debate on material agency more in general, that perhaps it would go beyond what is the, the more specifically Buddhist uh, yeah. context. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I definitely see this issue here. Um, the, uh, it's also reflected, and I, again, I think it's impossible to generalize across all of these, um, but clearly, and in fact, in the seminar tomorrow, I'm going to show a passage where once an, uh, a relic was in inserted inside of the, um, of, of the Seviyoji image, uh, supposedly a drop of blood appeared on the forehead. Um, which gets rarely noted, but that uh, is an interesting uh, claim there, right? So that notion of, of you know, does, you know, that, that uh, sort of agency or the, uh, the life of, of, of the image is there. And I think in some of the vocabulary, it's clearly uh, the case where a, um, a consecrated image is sometimes referred to in Chinese as a huofu, a living, a living Buddha. Um, and indeed, uh, um, so I think in, you could make, it, it could go on both sides of the argument I, or of that, of those arguments about materiality and agency of, of, of statues and things like that. Um, you know, you get great stories obviously in literature, right? About some of those and you get the famous ones from Japan about Fudo images that, you know, when they're put in the, a place that they don't like, they fly back to their home uh, one, that famous one in uh, Tokyo, I forget the, the, uh, um, oh, what's it called? The, I forget the name of the, the temple, but it, it, you know, it'd been moved to Osaka and then it would fly. Um, uh, it's called the Tobi Fudo uh, temple, right? And so you get a lot of those kinds of stories and, and agency involved with statues, but it doesn't mean all of them were considered that way. The ones that really intrigue me, however, are ones where in the consecration document or the, the consecration materials where it, um, uh, these are not necessarily for, the, or, or definitely not for the category of, say, standard Buddhist images or Buddha images or Bodhisattva images, uh, but in the more votive images that one finds. And, and some of those seem to have been done for living people. Um, in other words, the, the language is very clear in it. They, they describe, uh, they carve diao ke sheng xiang, a living image. Um, and it seems to, so then I think it, this is where it may add, uh, you know, Sangyup, that what does it add to our understanding of Buddhism? Well, um, it does add to our understanding about images in East Asia, particularly in China, where uh, if these are images of, of an ancestor, this goes against everything that uh, were part of ritual, um, uh, ritual texts that said ancestors should only be uh, represented in, in a, in a shun way, in a, a 
in a, a spirit tablet. That is to say, uh, a written name on a spirit tablet and, and were not to be um, represented uh, in an anthropomorphic fashion. And, and here, uh, we definitely have cases where it's uh, a living ancestor who is depicted. And then you start to look at it really differently. And it gets kind of interesting because you're now looking at a, a, at like a portrait statue. Um, uh, it, it becomes kind of like uh, what you have in Japan with say like Shinzo uh, type uh, images um, and things like that. And you just look at it differently. They're not kind of mass produced generic images, but uh, really uh, are of, uh, of somebody. Yeah, very personalized, you could say, yeah. Yes. Yeah, then yep. there would be, and there are a number of questions that, uh, to relate to the Buddhist statues with other deities, with Taoist deities and what yeah. they do with that. Uh, but I wonder whether we shouldn't stop here. Um, well, may I just jump in with, well, there was please. a question from Gregory Scott um, going back to China and asking, why do you think, you James, think that this practice is not so much remarked upon in Chinese historical sources? If it's for anti-religious bias or so why, why there is not much written in there? Well, actually for... You know that, yeah, great. it's a great uh, question because that question is like haunted me for over a decade, actually. Um, it's literally, it's really confounded me uh, um, of what's going on here. And I, you know, there's a, a kind of a perhaps easy answer to that, which is probably totally unsatisfying, um, which is, well, there's a couple and, and both of them uh, don't satisfy me personally, and I'm sure they wouldn't satisfy you. One of them is, uh, is um, goes in the direction of, actually they're polar opposites too. On the one hand, one can say that the practices were so common that they just weren't written down, right? That these were just, uh, just common in, in the rituals. And, and then the corollary to that was that the rituals had been passed down kind of secretively. The, and these are, and, and in fact, that, that may have some truth to it. In fact, the kinds of um, consecration rituals uh, were done uh, somewhat, they were done secretively and by ritual specialists um, that probably came just with a codre, an oral uh, component to it um, that we just don't have access to. That may be the case, I don't know, but we, all, we often find secretive stuff that's written down, you know, uh, that shouldn't have been that we find, uh, you think of all of those kirigami and stuff in Japan or other, you know, things that you get surprised by. So, so that doesn't entirely satisfy me, but, um, but it is shocking that it, it took, um, uh, unless I just haven't, you know, found the material yet, um, uh, it's really not until the, um, maybe, uh, you know, late 19th century into early 20th century when we start to get uh, kind of, now you can find these are, you know, uh, quite common all around uh, from the most uh, uh, kind of village uh, level, um, small scale rituals specialists that, uh, and those are ritual manuals that they again, receive from their master, hand copy themselves, and then they work with those. Um, and so those we have definitely plenty of those and, and those go back to, uh, gosh, uh, probably Mingua period um, and maybe a little bit before. Um, and then we also have a lot of, you can find all kinds of stuff on the internet now about sort of Taoist, uh, you know, statue consecration and what's, there's quite a lot actually available for Taiwan, for example. Um, and uh, Lin Weiping at, tai, at National Taiwan University has written quite a bit on, uh, on consecration of Taiwanese uh, popular images and things like that. Um, so I, I really don't have a good answer uh, to um, necessarily why, it's just kind of speculation, but it still haunts me. And, but there is something kind of, um, uh, I don't know, interesting about the fact that when we do get it written down, the earliest writing of it down, uh, that it comes from the iconoclast themselves. I mean, that to me is, uh, is just, uh, you know, part of the story here. And that's important to, uh, to bring out actually. And, um, and, and, you know, this isn't to beat up on the missionaries at all. In fact, I have kind of a, 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 some respect for them in the sense that they were really careful observers and, and wrote down an incredible amount of detail in some cases about this. Uh, we have nothing like that as far as I know from contemporary uh, Chinese writing. Um, I, I wanted to close, but there is a last question that uh, brings back the question of, uh, um, well, destroying, if not by uh, iconoclastic uh, action, uh, but by uh, um, uh, volunteer, let's say, uh, by conscious action. Yeah. And uh, Bernard asks whether you have ever found uh, instructions to put remains of old statues inside a new one, 
of something that has been destroyed as a way of uh, disposing the old one. And before that, there was a question that was speaking about uh, um, uh, somehow about disposing of old sutras that you had so many of them and you didn't know where to put them and that, so you can uh, very well put them inside a statue. So there is yeah. there this, this sort of repurposing of, of stuff uh, or preserving an older statue or older material by putting it into, yeah. into the, the new one. Yeah, those are, I mean, those are things that I, I think people have, have speculated about, again, just of, of what goes inside. And um, I mean, if, if, your perp, if your point is to, to Zhuangyan or to, uh, you know, to, you know, to think about an adornment, um, then you would put something of, of value, you would think, inside of it rather than get rid of the old. But I'm not saying that that would be, you know, across the board either. Probably, you know, people were doing that just to also to fill space as well. Um, and so you get, uh, you know, many old uh, sutras that are just put in uh, like that, that are very common too. I've never, I haven't come across anything. It doesn't mean it didn't happen of old statues being put inside. Um, but the destruction of uh, is interesting. Um, so there are deconsecration rituals as well of how to take the power out of an image. Uh, and, um, and also uh, people would get rid of them. Um, uh, so I mentioned the, 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 the one place in Penang for, for, you know, temples where you would bring it, uh, to get rid of it. Um, uh, it, it doesn't seem to have been something that was taken lightly either. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we know other things like, uh, during, um, cultural revolution, for example, in order to, that, um, you know, these were, this is when the altars were just stripped bare in these, in this region and, and why we have so few. And I think that's why we have so many foreign collections as well as things became uprooted from their local areas and moved out and, and were sold bulk. I mean, one of the collections of those popular images was a customs bust from, that was being containers being shipped off from Changsha and Hunan down to Hong Kong. And that collection has primarily Buddhist uh, images in it because it would be what they would rec be recognized on the international art market. But locals, you know, would uh, at times then uh, bury the images as well um, and then ostensibly go back and, and get them after things calm down. But um, so, uh, um, so yeah, there are you know there are ways to get rid of a of a of a statue that's no longer efficacious. Yeah. 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 Okay, I think we have to stop here. Uh, you've been okay. extremely generous in sharing more and more. No, I, and it's really no, I love it. I wish anybody to write to me too because I've I've learned a lot. I mean, it's it's so many. Um, so everybody comes. Chat, so yeah. there are lots of very nice suggestions from all yeah. people that you know or you do not know, but um, we'll, we'll pass that on. And I'm really sorry for uh, uh, everyone whose uh, who's, uh, question I didn't manage to put across in the right terms. I, I tried to summarize a lot. Um, so thank you again for all of you who have attended the lecture. Thank you very, very much to our speaker. And you'll have only my applause here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to remind those of you who have uh, registered for the seminar, well, our students mainly, and a few people from here, around here, that uh, the seminar is going to be held tomorrow at 12 o'clock uh, British time at an impossible time for Professor Robson, which is six o'clock in the morning for him. That's uh, right. So <laughs> thank you again also for that. I also, there were questions also about uh, recording. The lecture is going to be recorded. All our whole lectures are recorded and uh, uh, you can find them on the website of the center in a while. Uh, the seminar tomorrow will not be recorded. It will be just a more informal um, way of talking around about this. Uh, so thank you very much to all participants and uh, have a good evening if you are on British time or have a good day if you are elsewhere.